people on Zoom, welcome. Um, can you all hear me okay, people on Zoom? I'm gonna look to Quinn who is able to see your responses. Yeah. Brilliant, fantastic. Okay, so before I introduce Dr. Packer, I should say I'm Georgia Mason. I'm director of the Campbell Center for the Study of Animal Welfare. This is our second research seminar of the um, semester. I'm going to start, first of all, with a land acknowledgement. And I think um, we've all noticed it's just been a spectacularly gorgeous fall. So as autumn continues, let's take a moment to be grateful for the land, this beautiful autumn weather we're having, and to recognize that all of this country relies, uh, resides on the unceded or, treat, or treaty or territorial land of the Métis, the Indigenous and the Inuit peoples. For those of us here in Guelph, uh, we're on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, who are part of the Anishinaabek peoples. But I should say the context is broader than that because the Anishinaabek have a treaty called the Dish With One Spoon Treaty that you might have heard of with the Haudenosaunee people, oh, I managed to pronounce it excellent, who you may know as the Six Nations. And I raise that because a part of the Haudenosaunee culture that I think is really lovely is that they have a Thanksgiving address in which they very systematically and very poetically thank all of creation, including the animals and the plants and the stars and the suns. So if you feel like a bit of good news, Google Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address or Mohawk Thanksgiving Address, you'll find some really lovely videos and it's a real tonic, especially when you think, God, there's nothing on the news except for bad news. So that is my land acknowledgement. It's a little unorthodox, but it's from the heart. And also from the heart is a welcome to the fabulous Rowena Packer, who is one of the few people who can call me granny. She's one of my academic grandchildren because she did her PhD at the Royal Veterinary College with the brilliant Charlotte Byrne, who was a PhD student of mine a long time ago. And Rowena's had a very distinguished career specializing in dog health and welfare issues. Although she loves all animals, she's very um, adamant that she also loves rats and cats and everything. Um, she, amongst her, um, amongst notable things, she's won a U4 Young Animal Welfare Scientist of the Year Award. She also won a very competitive BBSRC Research Fellowship, which has just come to an end. And she's now an assistant professor in the Royal Veterinary College, where she runs a thriving group working on many aspects of dog health and welfare, from how do humans make decisions about the dogs they take on, to how does neurology affect canine condition? So she's canine cognition. She's here today um, to speak to us and also to visit with Fiona James with whom she's collaborating on canine epilepsy. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand you over to Rowena. And just um, if anyone wants to meet with her, she does have some free time on Friday. I should also say, I think this is gonna be the only Cecil talk that feature, features organized crime. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, George, and I hasten to add, I am not one of the crime lords, unfortunately. So today we're going to be... Oh. This one? Yeah, yeah. yeah? is it all good? Thanks, Quinn. All good. Um, hi, lovely to be here. Thanks for such an amazing turnout. It's great to see you all in person. It's a real treat to be back in Guelph. So I'm going to be talking about puppies, which is usually a popular topic. Um, it's a pretty depressing one, I'm afraid, today, so I'm really sorry. I've got some cute puppy pictures in here. But it's a little bit of the dark side of the puppy trade and the puppies that we know and love. So today we're going to be talking about the pandemic puppy phenomenon. We're going to be going on a bit of a romp. This was a project that was meant to be my little six month COVID proof research project that has turned into a behemoth, um, which is a great thing in many ways. And we've been exploring over the past two years, obviously, many facets of the pandemic puppy phenomenon, which I'll be exploring with you today. That includes the past risk to canine welfare, so what has already transpired, how did puppy buying motivations change during this period, how did people go about buying puppies, did it differ from pre-pandemic, and also how did those little early lives, that really key period of dogs' lives, differ during the pandemic. You think about some of the current present risks to welfare, so thinking about whether some of the changes that we documented in 2020 are persisting. And then we're going to think about some of the emerging and future welfare risks, so this whole time bomb concept. So thinking about some of the behavioural issues that we're documenting in a cohort of pandemic puppies that we're following over time, 
And also, this is from a UK perspective, but seeing that this also looks like it's pretty global, this perfect storm of the cost of living crisis intersecting with the pandemic public phenomenon, and whether that's going to cause more of the issues that we are anticipating. So I don't really need to teach you all to suck eggs. The last couple of years have been pretty wonky for us all. That's the scientific term. We've had really dramatic lifestyle changes, different degrees for different people, but periods of furlough, self-isolation, homeworking and homeschooling, which have caused a real challenge to international mental health. And during this early period of the pandemic, so thinking back to the spring of 2020, there were widespread media reports, both in the UK and across the globe, that Animal welfare organisations are getting pretty worried that people seem to be looking in pretty large numbers for puppies during this period. So this is the UK Kennel Club. They have a find a puppy tool. And they found even in this very early phase of the pandemic in April to May of 2020, that there's over a 200% rise in people searching for puppies on that website. One of my colleagues over at the University of Nottingham did a really neat statsy project um, on looking at the relationship between how strict government policy was regarding the pandemic and interest in puppies. So I'm sure all of us have been guilty at some point of Googling puppies, whether we intend to buy one or not. And this is looking at Google Trends analysis. So looking at the actual keyword of puppy and what people, when people were searching for it between 2018 and 2021. And we've got graphs here at the top from the UK and the bottom from Canada. So this is looking at different parts of the world. And in the UK and in Canada, there was an exponential increase in interest that started and completely coincided with the first period of government restriction, often known as lockdowns or stay at home orders. And this peaked and continued for quite some time in the UK and then faced a downturn towards the end of 2020. Canada followed a very similar pattern, but their peak in interest was a little bit later for you guys. It was in February of 21 versus December of 2020 in the UK and was persistently high at the end of this study. And welfare scientists and welfare interested people like all these people you guys in the room today were pretty worried about this. There was loads of news articles about puppies, but most of them rang some pretty big alarm bells in terms of what was going on. So there was concerns that people flocking to buy puppies could have three major consequences. So there's challenges in terms of people who are buying puppies might have been engaging in that decision pretty impulsively, not thinking through the actual um, logistics of owning a dog for potentially 12 plus years if they live an average lifespan. And they might not be suited to keeping a puppy after or as the pandemic restrictions relaxed. Also, of course, every time there is demand for dogs, this is where the organized crime element comes in. Breeders and dealers will cash in on that demand really rapidly least soaring demand which has to be met in some way by the trade and in many ways through illegal puppy farming or illegal importation of puppies and then lastly actually thinking about the lives of these puppies we know the first 16 weeks of a dog's life is essential for their development in the future and during those really strict periods of lockdown where our lives were so so different and de there was deficits of social interactions for those puppies they had lack a lack or a deficit in socialization and habituation experiences particularly during those periods so back in the summer of 2020 it's one of those projects where I thought somebody's going to study this surely come on guys somebody somebody do this project because otherwise I'm going to have to and then the VVA so the British Veterinary Association their charity the Animal Welfare Foundation advertised for funding for COVID proof death space projects and I thought well I suppose I'm going to have to give it a go and very kindly they funded the start of this work where I was interested in can we capture a little bit more about this phenomenon is this just puppy buying on a really grand scale or are there actual changes to the nuts and bolts of it are people buying dogs for different reasons and in different ways so we recruited two cohorts of puppies that were bought under 16 weeks of age in either 2019 and again we looked from March to December because we know the seasonal variation in puppy buying particularly around Christmas and so we were interested in having an identical date range of puppies that were bought pre-pandemic and then during this early phase of the pandemic in 2020. This is a large online cross-sectional survey. We relied heavily on lots of our contacts across the UK and the veterinary and welfare organisations to recruit a really large sample. And again, we were looking specifically at puppies that were bought because there was a spike in adoption during this period too, but we were particularly interested in the welfare consequences of demand for puppies in particular and how people were going about buying them. So we've specifically honed in on that for this project.
We had a really good response over seven and a half thousand people. And after cleaning the data, this was my absolutely spectacular research assistant, Claire Brand, who spent far too many hours cleaning the data set. We whittled that down to over six and a half thousand um, valid responses. It says one thing from survey studies in life, it's that people will answer surveys whether they're eligible to be included or not, but hey. <laughs> So this is the results of our first paper on this work that we published last year, which was comparing the owner side of things. So why were people buying these puppies and how did they go about it? So to start with who were buying, who was buying pandemic puppies? The two major demographic shifts that we saw during this period were that 2020 dog owners were more likely to have no previous dog ownership. So they're more likely to be first time dog owners. And in terms of the household demographics within those um, puppy households, Owners are more likely to have children in the household, particularly those aged five to 10. So why do those two things matter? There's been lots of media surrounding this, particularly around first time dog owners. And actually there's reasonable literature to back this up. So first time dog ownership is associated with a number of negative outcomes for dogs. This includes an increase in the reporting of behavior problems, including serious public health risks like aggression, also many welfare relevant behaviors such as separation related problems and noise phobias. So the question mark here is whether these are truly more likely in this population or whether as a first time dog owner, owners are interpreting their own dog's behavior differently, whether they have a very different kind of threshold for what is normal or non-pathological. And again, might be more inclined to consider something undesirable if they don't recognize some of those things that dogs just need to do, dogs need to chew. And if you're not gonna give them the right toy, they're gonna chew so far. So those kind of concepts. We also have issues in terms of first time owners perceiving an increased burden of ownership. And again, this could be that there isn't an appreciation of the day to day labor of looking after a dog prior to acquisition. And then both of these factors very likely culminate in an increased risk of relinquishment. So dogs that were bought by first time dog owners are more likely to be relinquished. And again, this is likely to be a combination of some of these factors around ignorance of species specific behaviors. It's also some data around unrealistic expectations for the role that dogs might have in their children's lives. People think their puppy is going to be their kid's best friend and that they're somehow going to, um, without supervision, just be able to entertain one another where we know that's really not true. And also the time and ownership, the time and labour of ownership. So why do people go about buying pandemic puppies? The top three reasons are pretty consistent throughout these two years. And we can see, as we would probably fully expect, companionship, in this case for the respondent, was by far the number one reason. But the one factor, and there was many, we had about 20 different factors we explored here, that increased the most was people wanting to have a puppy to improve their or their household's mental health. And again, that's no surprise, but there's also quite a few headlines during that period that I'm sure would have made you guys twitch too about why buying a puppy during this period was a really good idea for you and your family's mental health. In terms of what characteristics people were looking for in a puppy during this period, I think the general overall theme is they're looking for an easy dog. Now, I'm sure all of you guys know there's no such thing as an easy dog, but the kind of characteristics people were looking for were puppies that were good with children or breeds that were good with children, which we'll explore more in a moment, but we know no dog off the shelf is just good with kids. They were easy to train, which again could reflect this change towards first time dog owners. This kind of lifestyle niche that their, their size fits in with that owner's lifestyle and also peer to peer influences. So a breed that friends or family might own. So we've got a huge explosion of cockapoo do schnoodly doos in the UK. And I think a lot of that is cultural transmission of, well, my cousin or my friend or the person at the pub owns a cockapoo, so I'm gonna too. Now, thinking about some of the serious consequences of what people were looking for, this increase in owners having kids in the household, particularly young preschool or primary school age kids, and wanting a child that's perceived, a child, a puppy that's perceived to be of a breed that's good with children, is a real um, red flag from a public health perspective. There are potential positive benefits um, for families owning dogs um, during lockdown. So there has been some data showing that those children had some buffering effect of having that animal companionship during some of those periods where many children reported extreme loneliness. But there's also been some really interesting and alarming work from the University of Liverpool showing that there was a real spike in paediatric dog bites um, emergency presentations during this period, particularly the first summer of lockdown, which is likely to be due to greater exposure to dogs during that period. Dogs and kids have probably never spent more time at home together. And again, that's potentially being linked with the pandemic puppy boom at that point. 
This is one of my big bugbears in life, being the owner of a naughty dog and a naughty three-year-old, is pictures online of dogs and children inappropriately interacting. Now, the desire for a dog that's safe with children is ubiquitous. When there's studies of the ideal companion dog, these examples are from Australia and Italy, there's a couple of examples. Being safe with kids is a really desired characteristic. But there's really no robust evidence to say that any breed is a particular risk or protective factor against dog bites. And there's a real need for owner education around that, that dogs aren't off the shelf good with kids or good pets to have in households with children, and that none of them are bomb proof. And again, promoting safe child dog interactions involves a lot of input, involves a lot of supervision. This is an example from a UK um, middle class, middle aged magazine, Good Housekeeping. Um, with a list of the best dog breeds for kids with, again, interaction pictures with dogs and children that really shouldn't be encouraged. We think about what, what owners looking for in a breeder. So thinking about what kind of, kind of breeder did you want? And there's words like responsible are used, but what does responsible mean? That's really one of those constructs we have to pull apart a little bit more. The top three characteristics people were looking for across each year were that people wanted to see their puppy with its mother, that they wanted somebody that they felt cared for their dogs and that they felt was trustworthy. And again, these were consistent across both years. There were, however, some concerns that there was a re reduction in demand of people who were looking for a breeder that performed health tests on their dogs. So we know it varies between countries that we have both genetic and phenotypic screening of um, potential breeding dogs that are often registered with the Kennel Club. And also a reduction in this case of Kennel Club assured breeder scheme members, which is, I'm not gonna say perfect, but it's one of our gold standard um, schemes in the UK where breeders are audited and they have a certain standards that they need to meet, including to some degree health tests for their breed. And again, there was a drop off in demand for those types of breeders. In terms of where did owners go and find their breeders, we know the internet is the playground for puppy buyers and puppy sellers and animal selling websites are ubiquitous um, in all countries now. And we can see that was by far the most common place that puppies are sourced from. The only change that we really saw is a reduction in puppies that were bought via the Kennel Club website. And again, not to say that the Kennel Club are a paragon of virtue, but potentially slightly more reliable than some of, for example, the generic selling websites. In the UK, we have Gumtree. I learned about one today. Is it Kijiji? Is that you guys' version? <laughs> I went on that for the first time this morning and was horrified. So, hey. <laughs> but we know that potentially we would rather... Um, get our, our breeders, our owners to go towards breeders who are recognised in some way. Again, some of this might be a reflection that some of those initial sources were actually exhausted, so established breeders just did not have the volume of puppies to meet that demand. Also, owners were less likely to go about and ask the breeder whether they performed any health tests on their dogs. So they both weren't looking for those breeders and they weren't asking them if health tests had been carried out. And again, in part, unless a breeder is very internally motivated to carry out those tests that can be expensive, it's a real challenge in terms of needing that continued demand for those tests to be performed. This was a really important one here. So when we think about what our lives were like during those periods of lockdown, where we weren't, for example, going out to the shops anymore, we're doing a lot of our lives online. This led to huge changes in the way that people bought their dogs. So we had a huge shift from around eight in 10 to around six in 10 owners visiting their puppy in person prior to purchase. And this is pretty much, pretty much our mantra, wherever you are in the world. If you wanna buy a puppy, visit it once, visit it twice, ideally visit it three times, the third time when you take it home. Don't just collect it the first time you visit it. And we'll explore why that is in a moment. And instead puppies went online like we all did, like we are right now on Zoom. Puppies were viewed via live video calls, which is pretty rare beforehand, around 6%, and via video and photo recordings. And that one's a real challenge because again, there's the potential of what we call pet fishing. So being sold a puppy, it actually isn't the puppy that you're gonna get because you've been shown a picture, you put a deposit down on that picture, but it's not actually the dog that you're gonna end up with. There was also a concurrent change in the way that people actually purchase their dogs, so from pre-purchase to actual purchase. And in the UK, it's a legal requirement to collect your puppy or visit your puppy inside the, the property where it was bred and raised. But here we can see we had a huge drop off from around 85% down to just half of puppies being collected from inside the breeder's property. And instead, this shift to outdoors, so seeing puppies being collected from doorsteps from allegedly that breeder's property. And this is where the challenges come in, where there's a potential smoke screen to the actual environment that dog was raised in. Also huge ch changes in the, who was seen with puppies um, during that collection visit. So a reduction in puppies seen with their mother, 
which again is a legal requirement in the UK, and a reduction in puppies seen with litter mates, with more puppies being sold on their own, often said to be the last of the litter or to be a single litter, single puppy litter, which again does have some red flags in terms of how common can that truly be. Money was a huge part of this. So we've already said money was a huge driving factor in the pandemic puppy phenomenon. But there was a real desperation for puppies, at least in the UK. People were desperate to get their hands on a puppy. And that led to a new, really quite new phenomenon of pre-purchase deposits. So having to place money on that puppy so you could secure it as your own. One of the big UK websites is called Pets for Homes. And they have a deposit box function where you can literally put down the money electronically and then you've secured your puppy. And in some cases, hundreds of people were trying to put down deposits on single puppies. That's how much competition there was. So again, that became far more mainstream as a practice. And alongside that, the price of puppies really inflated by around 62%. And I think the thing that I find interesting on this graph, if we look at the purple bars, we can see towards the right, these are almost new categories. So before the pandemic, puppies costing more than, in this case, um, GBP, 2,000 to 3,000 pounds, was extremely rare before the pandemic. And indeed, there was no puppy sold for over 3,000 pounds before the pandemic. But these categories are now the most common. A big alarm bell, and I will explain in a moment why this is even more of an alarm bell, is that puppies were more likely to be sold with a passport during 2020. And again, this was still what we think was relatively rare, but actually when we translate it to how many puppies this could be, this is enormous. So we're going from 4.1% to 7.1%. And some of these sales appeared to be quite clearly illegal. So in the UK, there are two pieces of relevant legislation in terms of importing puppies. The pet travel regulation, so this is how in the, well, back in the days when we were in the EU, we would be able to travel with dogs between countries with their puppy passport, their pet passport. And then the Belay Directive, which is a commercial um, piece of legislation about the commercial import of puppies. And under both of those legislation, you have to have a puppy that's at least 15 weeks old to have gone through its full course of rabies vaccinations to be able to be imported. But actually it was the younger puppies, so puppies that were like seven to eight weeks, who were more likely to have come with a passport, indicating that it was likely they were part of the illegal puppy trade. And again, our figures corroborate with sources like the Blue Cross, RSPCA and Dogs Trust, who found an over 100% increase in the number of puppies that were imported during 2020, including some of their investigative missions at the docks of the UK, seeing puppies smuggled, often in the boots of cars. In terms of why this was happening, as I've just mentioned, demand for puppies really was outstripping um, the supply from at least legitimate welfare conscious sources. And unknowingly, many owners were fully um, putting their money into the European puppy trade, which is enormous, and I'll explain more in a second. But in terms of welfare implications, these are pretty profound. We haven't talked about the mothers much here, but we have to think that those mothers are somewhere, often in Eastern Europe, living in really not welfare conscious environments that could be very stressed. So we think about some of those epigenetic effects. Those conditions are often very much in line with intensive agricultural conditions and again this pushes down costs for the breeder so they could spend as little as 25 pounds raising a puppy for maybe six or so weeks and then importing them for example to the UK or indeed to Canada as we'll explore in a moment and selling them for several thousand pounds so the margins are enormous and again many of those puppies then travel long distances at a very young age without their mother for the UK, that's often long road journeys across Europe for maybe up to two days. And as we'll see in a moment, for countries like Canada, that could involve very long uh, distance air travel. But as we've said, the motivation there is huge because it's financial. The estimated annual sale of puppies in the UK is around 800,000 to 1.3 million per year. And just the sales through advertising online alone is thought to be worth 130 million pounds a year. And as Georgia mentioned at the start, puppy trafficking is the third largest illegal trade in Europe. So you wouldn't think that puppies and drugs would go hand in hand, but they're often the same crime groups. This is a really useful quote that encapsulates this from Jennifer Marr and Tanya Wyatt in the UK, saying that consumer behaviour, the preference for specific designer dogs, so as we'll explore things like um, Frenchies being a really poster child of this, but also our designer crossbreeds, an implicit trust in online advertising has greatly facilitated the illegal trade as buyers become increasingly removed from the origins and movement of the dogs. So people buying puppies having no idea what the provenance of that animal is beyond I bought it from this person who says that they bred it in their house and this is their mum. In Canada, I'm sure you're all more than aware of this case that very much made the news in Europe too, of just down the road from here in um, Toronto, 
um, this uh, a flight um, that was thought to be a commercial importation of around 500 puppies on one individual flight where over 30 of them were dead on arrival and many of them were very um, in very poor condition when inspected. And again, this is just another reflection of the lengths that the puppy trade will go to to make money, that if there are owners in Canada that are more than willing to not ask those questions, that they'll get their puppy, potentially not even for a cheaper price, for a really good expensive price for the breeders, that it's worth trying to charter. Planes are absolutely crammed with these dogs to meet that demand. And again, this is my little morning on Kijiji. Wow, you guys are just as bad as us. <laughs> Makes me feel better and worse at the same time. But yeah, again, this is just looking around Toronto. This is, these are dogs that are for sale right now. So if anybody's got seven grand for a micro American bulldog, then it's there and waiting for you to buy it. So again, this is just ubiquitous. We could have these adverts from any country on any day. I don't have to cherry pick adverts. They're just there and waiting. Some of them, look really quite legitimate in terms of people talking about their puppy and how much they care for them and all of the different conditions you might have to meet to be their owner. This one made me laugh, but not in a happy way. The French you hear saying that um, they are ready to go, brackets, no shots, that's for you and your vet to do. <laughs> okay, great. So I don't think the bar doesn't have to be very high to even advertise dogs. You can advertise them in a way that makes it quite clear you're not really that fussed about their well-being, but somebody will still buy them because these are popular breeds. These are Frenchies, these are fluffy Frenchies, which is the kind of next escalating level of weirdness. So while this trade is booming, it's going to be really difficult to try and improve the welfare of these dogs. So when we think about some of the changes that we saw during the pandemic that are real red flags for welfare. We've got these hidden home environments of people not going to see where that puppy was bred, which means that breeders can have any condition they very well want, or they can bring dogs into their household as a trader, they can import them from a puppy farm to what appears to be a really nice home, Airbnb. Do we have Airbnb in Canada too? Um, in the UK have paired up with some of the UK animal welfare charities to try and tackle this because quite often an illegal crime group will hire an Airbnb for a week, they'll have a litter turn up on Monday, they'll sell them within two days and then they'll finish up and move on and it looks like it was a clean family home. I don't present it today but we've got some new data from this project looking at what people perceive to be a good household for a puppy to be bought from. And in all honesty, so long as it's clean and it kind of lives the middle class dream and you can imagine that that dog has a nice life there, then you can get away with anything. So it's very easy to replicate that if you only see it for maybe half an hour while purchasing that puppy. Again, around a quarter of pups are seen without their mum or litter, despite this being a legal requirement. And again, puppies being separated from their mums at an early age is a risk factor for future behavioural issues. We'll explore in a moment. Previewing deposits, just allowing this trade to boom because the breeders were guaranteed to have money. There was always a customer. Buying on first visit, again, means that they don't even have to make an effort to pretend that facade only needs to be there for that time that you visit. If you visit, visit and visit again, it's a lot of effort to have to pretend that that is your house over a period of eight weeks. It's probably impossible for breeders to really replicate that at the same level. I think this convenience culture, I'm sure we're all guilty of doing a bit of Amazon um, ordering in the dead of night during lockdowns, but that should be restricted to products that are non-sentient, ideally. So when we think about this click and collect culture that the pandemic has kind of um, encultured within us, particularly with online delivery too, we did see a small but significant increase in puppies being delivered straight to the new owners' houses. We need to reflect on the fact that puppies aren't just a commercial product and that they're an animal that potentially has 12 years of thinking and feeling ahead of them. And so I can see is legislation the answer. I find legislation really interesting in this area, but it clearly isn't doing all that we want it to do. This is obviously relevant to start with from the UK. So we've got in the UK what's called Lucy's Law, Lucy being this little cavalier here who was a puppy farm bitch, um, who's owned a campaign strongly to um, stop third party sales of puppies. So stop puppies being sold, for example, through pet shops or through puppy dealers, instead being seen with the mother in the place of birth. But again, we had one in four puppies that were still sold in this period without the mother present, and one in three who were collected from outside the property. So this clearly isn't yet at least as effective as it should be. Similarly, in Canada, we've got several cities across Canada that have imposed third party puppy sale bans. But again, there's reports that some pet shops are not complying with this and are continuing as usual. 
We also had, for example, as you said, the Belli Directive in terms of the import of puppies, where many puppies were still being sold underage, having undergone long journeys with their passports. So I think in part, some of this does come down to the fact that do owners know or care about the provenance of their puppy? Would they know whether it was legal in terms of a sale? Would they care if their puppy came with a passport? Is it just that their puppy is well-traveled or does it actually imply that something's really potentially gone quite wrong in that sale? We also looked more explicitly at how people felt that COVID had impacted their purchasing decisions. Because again, it could be that many people just wanted to buy a dog that year anyway. It could be the general cycle of life that their dog might have died and they wanted to have a new dog, not saying a replacement because I always get slapped if I say that, but they wanted that dog shaped hole in their life to be filled. And indeed there was probably plenty of those. And most owners in this period did feel that somebody um, had considered in their house of buying a dog before COVID, but around 40% of owners felt that the pandemic had influenced their purchase in some way. When we boiled this down to the most common reasons, by far and away, the most common reason, which I'm sure most of you will have guessed, was that they, they felt they had more time to care for a dog. That's the vast majority, almost 90% of owners cited that as the most common reason. Now, what's the challenge with this? So the problem there is we thought of those three key issues with the pandemic puppy crisis is around the suitability of those homes once restrictions had relaxed or when the pandemic was over, which we know is not yet. Um, so when we think of the relinquishment crisis, the UK, we had loads of headlines the last few years of people saying, oh, there's gonna be a huge tsunami of dogs being given up. We had the so-called not very nice term Freedom Day in the UK last July, which was again, probably just the conservative government trying to celebrate themselves. Um, <laughs> but there was a concern that once offices um, reopened that all these puppies would be given up. And we actually haven't seen that in a big way in the UK yet, this is my main word here, yet. Um, and is, this is quite interesting in terms of how the media might have a big headline, but it might only reflect, for example, one small rescue centre in Wales, in this case. Also saw similar headlines in Canada and see that there was uncertainty around what would happen to dogs that were bought during this period. People instead looking for alternative um, caregiving sources for their dogs, including daycare centres, but in some cases, some people giving up these puppies. So I'm now going to try and go through a little whistle stop tour of how the early lives of these puppies differed. This was a second paper we published with, again, the fabulous Claire Brand around the early life of these dogs. I'm only going to focus on a few areas because you're going to get bored and I will keep you here until it's probably dark outside otherwise. So a few key factors. So our pandemic puppies were less likely to have undergone a vet check under 16 weeks, which again, hopefully they will have been taken for a vet check pretty early uh, into their new life with their owner, including having their second vaccinations. But again, there's some concern here around some missed um, congenital abnormalities, things like heart murmurs, facial hernias, the kind of congenital differences we might see in these dogs at an early age that could have been sold and owners just have no idea that there's a problem with their puppy. And also, of course, a missed socialization experience. We know that vets can be terrifying a place for dogs, but dogs in an ideal world should be very comfortable and happy to enter a vet's because that means it's a much easier life for the vet, the dog and the owner. We also found that there was a slight significant increase in the number of conditions that were reported in these dogs. And this is the caveat, these are really young dogs at this point. Um, they were on average six months old at the time of the survey. And when we boiled this down into what kind of issues they're most likely to be diagnosed with, the two areas that were more common in our 2020 cohort were parasite infestations and skin disorders. And again, there's a the potential that some of that could reflect the acquisition from lower welfare sources with poor husbandry or preventative health care. We also have to think more culturally at the time there were some restrictions to access to preventative health care with the veterinary sector, knowing that the veterinary sector, at least in the UK, is still really on its knees in terms of having a real staffing shortage and having real challenges to keep staff um, during COVID, given how rife infections were at some points. In terms of breeder advice, um, our pandemic puppy owners are more likely to have received advice about their dog's diet, their health, their training and behavior, and their exercise regime than 2019 puppies. And this is a thing that we see more often. This is from previous study from Christina Cole at the University of Nottingham. The breeders are a more trusted source of advice for many dog owners than vets, particularly those who own pedigree dogs. And this is one that's a little bit speculative, but it's something to monitor in terms of tackling misinformation in the future. If we've got this kind of intersection of first time dog owners who trust their breeder, who might not have given them accurate information about their dog's future, we might have some challenges trying to undo some of that in the future. Now think about early life behavioral experiences. 
So one of the key things we know about puppies when we get them, we want to spend all our time with them. They're cute. You want to cuddle them. If you're stuck in lockdown, you're probably sitting them with them on your desk for most of the time, which is not a great idea. Um, Puppies need to learn to be left alone, which is a really important factor to try and reduce the development of separation related behaviours. There's been some really nice studies by the fabulous Emily Blackwell at the University of Bristol on that work. But again, our pandemic puppies were less likely to have been left alone deliberately for any period of time than our 2020, 2019 puppies. Some of that is just a facet of when we sampled these dogs. So some of them hadn't yet reached 16 weeks. So their owners intended to in the future. The bigger challenge is when we look at the mismatch between their current state of how, how often they're left alone and what the owner's future plans are. So we know this first 16 weeks is like the blueprint. You're telling the puppy, this is your life, little one. This is what you have to expect for the next 12 years. At the time of the survey, our pandemic puppies were less likely to be left alone for more than four hours, which is often used as a yardstick for how long you should leave dogs alone for without them having, for example, comfort breaks or some exercise. So it was pretty rare the dogs were left alone for more than four hours at this point, around one in 33 pandemic puppies. But then when we asked those, well, in the future, are you likely to leave them alone for more than four hours? It really skyrocketed. So more like one in 10 of these puppies were let, likely to be left alone for a longer period in the future. And again, there's some really nice work from Naomi Harvey and colleagues at Dogs Trust who found that a, certain, a significant change in leaving alone patterns can be a trigger even in adult dogs for the development of new separation related behaviors. I'm sure some of your dogs became Zoom celebrities during the pandemic. And there's so many images of people working from home, cuddling with their dogs, their dogs on their laptop. I mean, my dog had to get away because he'll get on my head and just generally be a nuisance. But it looks like a really nice idea, but in reality is potentially meaning that dog has no healthy boundaries in terms of being able to spend its time alone and be happy with that, to be comfortable in not having constant um, kind of communication and attachment with its owner on tap. So that's a potential challenge in the future. It's not all doom and gloom. I think some of our pandemic puppy owners really did strive to still give their dogs the appropriate socialization experience they needed. There were no difference in quite a few different behaviors that these dogs were exposed to during this crucial developmental period. They were just as likely to travel in a car, to walk in a public space or in a traffic. They were less likely to um, have either met people from outside their household or met dogs from outside their household. But again, owners whose puppy at the time of the survey were under 16 weeks intended to. So it was at the same level if they actually went through with their intentions. There's actually a couple of behaviors that pandemic puppies were actually more likely to have been exposed to. So they're more likely to have visited a groomer. And again, this is likely a facet of the boodle oodle schnoodle boodle um, movement that they need grooming. And ideally, they need to be groomed under 16 weeks, if not for their coat, if for their socialization experience, for getting used to what can be a really invasive couple of hours for those dogs, having a stranger touching their feet, touching their ears, having a hair dry near their face. It's things that dogs just naturally wouldn't be like, I'm okay with this. <laughs> We also saw, for some unknown reason, pandemic puppies were more likely to be exposed to fireworks. I don't know whether people in their boredom were having little firework parties in their gardens, but clearly something was going on in the UK, at least, with fireworks at this point. There were, however, some red flags that we really should take more seriously. So in terms of owner-led socialisation, pandemic puppies were less likely to have experienced visitors to their home age under 16 weeks, which makes sense if people were sticking with lockdown restrictions, then that's the right thing to do. But it meant around one in seven pandemic puppies had never experienced any visitors to their home. And we know that stranger related fear and aggression could potentially then become an issue in this cohort, given that it's been linked with inadequate socialization to that experience in other studies. We also found that our pandemic pups were less likely to have attended puppy classes, whether online or in person. And in total, around half of our pandemic puppies hadn't attended any formal puppy training under the age of 16 weeks, compared to just a third of 2019 puppies. And again, some of that makes sense. Puppy classes couldn't run. And again, online classes probably don't fulfill the same needs for those dogs. But why is this important? Well, to start with who was less likely to attend, little dogs who I know there's plenty of work out there to show that people treat little dogs differently they interpret their aggressive behavior differently we infantilize them we laugh at them they can be growling in somebody's face on TikTok and it becomes viral because it's just so funny when it's clearly not for that dog or potentially for that owner's face so when we think about small dogs being less likely to attend um, these classes it's important both from that dog receiving appropriate training but also from its owner learning about interpretation of dog behavior 
Also, our young owners and male owners were less likely to attend puppy classes. And again, it could just be a demographic that, that those kind of promotional materials are just not getting through to. Concerningly, people who live with children were less likely to attend puppy classes. And this could be a facet of how bloody difficult it is to try and handle a child and a dog at the same time in a class. But that's a, the kind of demographic that's super important to be exposed to these experiences. And also people with previous dog ownership experience were less likely to, which again might reflect that they feel like they've done this before, but we know that dog training methods change with time. Um, we get more and more um, scientific knowledge on how best to train our dogs. And we know there's huge variation in what a puppy class offers. So what they might have learned 10 years ago, which could have been based on aversive methods, would hopefully be less likely to be in a training class in 2020. This is important because we know that early life exposure to social and non-social stimuli in the key thing, a calm and controlled manner, not just a wild manner, like, oh, I got my dog to see all these things. Oh, they were stressed throughout it, but I ticked those boxes, guys. But while puppies are in that sensitive developmental period, introducing things in a calm and positive way is really key. And there's good evidence from a couple of large scale studies to show that it can decrease the likelihood of a number of important problem behaviors. It's also really key for dog owner interaction. So we know that owners who attended puppy classes are less likely to give up that dog in the future and also more likely to use reward-based methods, including positive reinforcement and negative punishment when they are training their dogs versus more aversive methods. So I think a key message is those pups that missed out on those socialization experiences and puppy classes during this period, if they don't have serious behavioral problems that would preclude them from attending those classes, they really should attend adult training classes for both the dog and the owner to learn. At this early stage, we also looked at what were the key, most common issues behaviorally in these dogs that the owners considered a problem. And we didn't compare these statistically because again, we're comparing apples and oranges, comparing five month old dogs versus one, one year, five month old dogs. But they were the kind of issues that we'd very much expect, jumping up at people, mouthing and pulling on their leads. So what we think of as typical puppy behaviors. And again, these are the same behaviors that have been seen in the Generation Pup, which is a large UK study run by Dogs Trust of puppies at six and nine months old in the UK. And I'll explore what their behavior is like now in a moment. So just to conclude on this, I think pandemic puppies were exposed to the majority of experiences at the same level as the, pan as the 2019 puppy cohort that we explored, but there were some differences that owners couldn't overcome, that they weren't able to engage in probably legally at the time, including people at their house or going to training classes in person. We also didn't assess the number and the quality of these exposures. So it could be that they didn't get as, as um, good exposures in terms of seeing the same stimuli repeatedly in that positive environment. So unfortunately COVID did thwart some of those important early experiences. And combined with what I've already discussed in terms of some of those provenance-based risk factors of how those dogs are acquired, it is likely that this cohort is more vulnerable to behavior challenges in the future. And think about some of the current welfare issues that we see now. So because I just can't stop collecting this bloody data and I'm about to do it again, um, I collected the same data set for 2021 because I wanted to know, well, was this just a blip? Was this pandemic restriction related or are these kind of more persistent issues that are embedding themselves into puppy buying culture in the UK? So we went about recruiting identical samples, same date range, same methods of UK puppies who were purchased this time during 2021 in that same date range. And we got another healthy sample of over 2000 valid responses. And again, we saw some reassuring um, changes here back to our 2019 baseline. So we went back to literally the identical level of first time ownership in our 2021 cohort. We also found that the number of puppies that were in households with children had not yet recovered to 2019 levels, so we're still persistently higher. In terms of why people were buying these dogs, the desire to purchase a dog that was perceived to be easy to train or good with children had again returned to 2020, what, 2019 levels. So it could be that we shifted that demographic a little bit back towards how it was beforehand. In some good news, 2021 owners were less likely to be desiring a breed based on its appearance. And we know in another world, we are perhaps thinking about appearance related health conditions in dogs. That is hopefully a good thing. But also we had a concurrent um, reduction in people desiring a breed that was perceived to have good health, which you would think would be pretty high up there. But again, is only just over a third of owners consider that an important part of their decision-making. In terms of health tests, 
and looking for breeders from the Assured Breeders Scheme. Again, there was a persistent reduction from 2019 through to 2021. So we're not seeing people particularly motivated for healthy dogs. That seems to be across the board with these results. There was encouragingly an increase in people who wanted to see their puppy with its mum. Albeit, this is still not 100%. I say this with a caveat pretty much always. And I go, yay, this is getting better, but it's still not perfect. All of these dogs should be seen with their mum. And yes, we're celebrating that it's going, that it's improving, but it's still not ideal. When we think about pre-purchase behaviour, it's something that will be said really easy. What should we do if somebody says, you know, I want to have a puppy? Do your research. It's one of those phrases that probably makes all of you twitch too. What does that mean? We want people to learn about how you buy a breed, how you pick your breed or your crossbreed. We want people to think about how do you find a, a breeder that's actually who they say they are and is doing the right things for animal welfare. We saw a reduction in people um, who were actually uh, carrying out pre-purchase research in 2021. But the flip of that was that more of those owners considered themselves experienced dog owners. So I'm not saying that's a good thing. I think everybody, when they buy a dog, whether they've had 100 dogs or whether they've had no dogs before, should still refresh themselves. Because this is, as we can see, a really fluid market. Things are changing. You're constantly trying to be outwitted by criminals. So you need to know what is the current status quo? What do I need to be avoiding? In terms of looking for information sources, charity websites were still less likely to be accessed, but again, um, friends and family were um, still more likely to be used as a source of information, less likely, sorry. There was still a persistent reduction in puppies being sourced from the Kennel Club in their Find a Puppy website. And again, this could be a shift away from purebred dogs towards designer crossbreeds. Our biggest demographic shift was mainly towards poodle crosses, as I've said jokingly, but Cavapoos really had a renaissance during the pandemic. This is Cavalier King Toss Spaniels crossed with poodles and also Cockapoos. And again, you're not going to find them via a purebred website. In terms of pre-purchase behaviours, there was an increase in owners who viewed their puppy in person, but this had still not yet recovered to 2021 level, 2019 levels. So we're seeing an improvement but without those restrictions being there, everybody during this period could have visited that puppy in person, but we're still seeing around a third that didn't. We're seeing alongside that a concurrent reduction in video calls, which again would make sense given people are actually starting to go back to see their puppies in person. Thankfully, this, this practice of putting down deposits, often many hundreds, if not thousands of pounds on puppies had returned back to 2019 levels, which again likely reflects that the level of demand had subsided. In terms of purchase behaviours, a lot of these behaviours that we saw in 2020 are still persisting, so still haven't recovered to 2019 levels. This includes people being provided with health screening results, people collecting their puppy from inside their breeder's property or from outside their breeder's property, which we don't want them to do. We're still seeing that that isn't back to the level that we would like it to be. Thankfully, we're seeing that the level of puppies that were collected with their mum present had gone back to 29 18 levels. But once again, the caveat, 15% of those pups were still not seen with their mum, which again, given that's a legal requirement and essential for that puppy's future development is a real challenge. A couple of areas that were of most concern here. So although the prices were on average a little bit lower, the significant rise overall still persisted into 2021. We can see with our new dark purple categories, we're still riding high in that two to three thousand pound category and again still a small but a new category of three thousand pounds plus being there and appearing even though the demand is diminishing the prices are still staying higher than they would have been our biggest challenging result was so the only behavior or the only change that we didn't just see hadn't returned to 2019 but it in fact had got worse than 2020 was puppies being sold with passports so rather than it normalizing to our 4.1 it instead increased to 10.5 percent of our 2,000 dogs had been sold with a passport which if that scales up it just reflects the enormity of the illegal puppy trade that's going on in the UK right now. So when we think about emerging and future welfare issues we are following lots of these puppies over time. So we, from our 2020 pandemic cohorts, we were funded very kindly by Battersea Dog, Dogs and Cats Home in the UK to follow these dogs and study a number of different facets of their lives, including their behavior and their health, the way that their owners are managing them. So things like their training, their access to veterinary care, their time spent alone. 
The dog owner bond, so thinking about things like expectations versus realities, how is that puppy that they brought back in the pandemic, how has that been met by the reality of now having either a teenager or a rambunctious two to three year old? And also how is COVID continuing to impact their ownership decisions? So, so far from this cohort, we've received responses from around 1,600 owners. We've had a really good response rate of around 68%, which given most cohort studies have around a 50% response rate, we're really pleased to see these people are carrying on telling us all about their and their dog's lives. And negative outcome reports have actually been relatively low so far. There have been some really sad stories, but in terms of rehoming, reselling, dying and euthanasia, we've had around 2% that have been reported so far with one of those four outcomes. We're following these dogs through to next February and we're actually we've just got funding to follow them through to their three. Now and we're going to start studying more about the cost of living crisis and that intersection, because that's one of our biggest concerns right now. Just a few bits of qualitative data now so I'm a complete qualitative data convert learning more deeply about the stories of some of these people and their lives really gives you a richer insight sometimes than just the pure numbers alone. So these are some of the reasons for rehoming and reselling dogs in our cohort. And again, these are probably reasons that many of you would have imagined. People's lives changing in a huge way, for example, having a baby and that feeling like that changed their priorities during the pandemic. People making decisions and then regretting them. So in this bottom left here, somebody buying a Cocker Spaniel, but just not realizing or not thinking at that point what kind of commitment that was to have a young, bouncy dog. And they admit to have made a wrong decision. But this quote on the top right here around um, one of the older dogs not getting on with their new pandemic puppy. I think we have to reflect that we can be quite judgmental of people who bought dogs during this period and forget that they are also people and we all make mistakes and that some people are doing their very best to keep these dogs in their homes where they can. But just this owner saying I worry about being judged too and I think there's an awful lot of judgment of people who went about buying a dog during this period. Also some real kind of tragedies in terms of the intersection of all of the different issues during this period so the dog this dog for example having significant issues with reactivity to strangers in the home which again something we would be predicted in that cohort making it very difficult for the owners to have people to their house but again saying that while they tried to engage in the ways that we would hope for example with behaviorists we know that there are long waiting lists that there's real restriction to veterinary and behavioral services that are persisting now and when these issues didn't improve that owner had to feel they had to rehome their dog there's also some similar stories around dogs being euthanized quite often due to behavioral euthanasia, which is a real risk factor in dogs aged two to three. Some of this again being due to owners feeling that they couldn't access training classes so nobody could help them with their dogs training. Others feeling that lack of access to vaccinations and training when their dog was in this crucial early period being another challenge and meaning that, for example, they weren't able to see their dog with its mum, their puppy with its mum and siblings during this phase. And also, for example, this really long quote on the right, the intersection of poor genetics in terms of lockdown when they were very young and being you know, unable to socialize them, going to training classes as they got older. So you can see there's a real recipe for owners being pretty traumatized by this whole experience and dogs who've had a very short and potentially very welfare compromised life due to many of these intersecting factors. I mentioned a moment ago, this is a bit of the danger zone really for these dogs as they are emerging into their second to third year. So the average age of dogs presenting for behavioural problems in practice is around two and a half to three and a half years old. And aggression is the most common undesirable behaviour in dogs that are presented to vets under three years of age. So this is a real time point for things becoming really problematic. We've already mentioned behavioural euthanasia as being the most common cause of death in our cohort. And it again makes sense. This is a study from um, the RVC, our Vet Compass epidemiological programme, collecting many millions of clinical ent entries of vet practices across the UK, finding that of dogs that were put to sleep due to behavioural problems at a young age, only 10% of them had been recommended a veterinary referral to a behaviourist, and only 3% had received either nutraceutical, pheromone, or pharmacological treatment. So very few had had any intervention to try and tackle those problems. So there's a huge need for behavioural support in this cohort to either keep them in homes or indeed to keep them alive. We know that early provenance and early life experiences are really key for dog behaviour. There's a couple of US studies finding that dogs bought from puppy farms or pet stores are more likely to have a range of complex behavioural issues compared to those, for example, sourced from home breeders. 
And we know that dogs that were bought without their mother or indeed literally their father present are more likely to be referred to behaviourists than those that weren't. So we're hoping that some of our analyses of this cohort are going to pick apart the impact of that early puppy buying behaviour on adult dog behaviour, on welfare and on the dog owner relationship, because you can feel like consequence free you can buy a puppy and make lots of what we would consider really poor decisions but your puppy might be generally quite healthy behave like a puppy and you don't ever feel like oh well, there was no there was no issue with that I've got away with it in some way where actually it's very likely that lots of those issues have a time lag we know lots of inherited diseases don't manifest until dogs are two plus years old and behavioral issues really come into the fore once dogs are two to three years old so I think from a public messaging perspective, being able to objectively link how you bought your dog with what your dog's health and welfare is like in the future is something that we're really excited to get together. In terms of our dog's current behaviour, this is hot off the press because this is data that's constantly churning in the only data set that's complete so far is 21 months. But we've been looking at what are the most common behavioural issues in these dogs and comparing it to, in this case, Generation Pups, this is UK dog data from dogs that were purchased before the pandemic. We're also comparing it to their 18 month time point at present. And although some of these issues look to be improving, so there's common issues we mentioned in them as puppies, pulling on the lead, jumping up at people, call recall, not coming back. There's some issues that are persisting that are also really quite a challenge. So things like um, guarding, resource guarding, things like food, toys and other items often anecdotally reported in some of our gun dog breeds like Spaniels. We can see that we've got over one in 10 of those dogs um, being reported to have that issue, which again, we saw that, issue, that picture earlier with the child um, trying to interact with the dog when it's eating. That's a real issue from a public health perspective. So we've got some issues here that we are really quite concerned about, particularly around aggression. And we're hoping again, we can try and link some of those early life, either behavioral experiences in terms of socialization or the provenance of these dogs to see what are risk factors for these outcomes. Some early results, again, first time ownership still appears really important. So we saw an increased likelihood of first time dog owners having dogs with recall issues, with barking and howling, or aggression towards people in their household. And again, we have every day, the poor research assistant constantly saying, we've had another dog put to sleep for this reason or that reason for the cohort. And again, quite commonly aggression towards people in the household coming up again and again. So if we think back to that relinquishment crisis, I mentioned before that it seemed to be this perceived tsunami that didn't happen. But we're now seeing increased media reports around this because of this intersection with the cost of living crisis. So people now reporting that they can't afford to keep their dog because of the rising costs of just being a human being with somewhere to live and just trying to exist, becoming more and more expensive. This case in the UK, but also seeing similar reports across the world. And again, this is just a few excerpts from some of our current data. So we ask owners at each time point, do you have any perceived barriers to continuing owning your dog in the next three months? And particularly in the most recent time points, we're seeing people commonly reporting that there's a conflict between owning their dog and work. So things like in these cases, their, their family members returning to the office or their children returning to studying, meaning that there isn't somebody around for their dog anymore. And that often intersecting with the cost of living crisis. So people having to find more work so that they can afford to live, meaning they don't have time with their dog. And people, for example, finding it challenging to afford daycare. So those dogs that have never been left alone in need, that companionship, for example, if they've um, developed separation related behaviors, my own doggy daycare has gone up in price by over 30%. And I can absorb that, but I know many households just wouldn't be able to. So it would be faced with leaving their dog alone for long days or relinquishing their dog. Again, this was just a very recent one from Toronto. Again, the same kind of issues being reflected on that the change in lifestyles after li the lifting of pandemic restrictions combined with the cost of living means people are really challenging and it challenging to own their dog. Even the cost of pet food having gone through the roof being a challenge. So just to conclude, I think with our pandemic po po puppy cohort, we have a really uniquely vulnerable generation here. We have so many intersecting and unfortunate factors that that both threaten their dog owner relationship, but also the lives of many of these dogs. The poor provenance linked with some socialization deficits and owner inexperience now appears to be having a negative effect on their behavioral welfare with a higher level of behavioral issues than we would expect compared to relevant literature. 
There's a huge need for behavioural support for this cohort, but we know that restricted access to this is a real issue due to both cost of living. We know accessing veterinary care or behavioural advice isn't free in many cases, and that people could have that as a barrier. Indeed, with the advent of Dr Google, people looking to do home care instead of accessing expert advice. In some cases, there's been some nice innovations. So different organisations trying to find ways to keep dogs in their households. For example, Dogs Trust in the UK have launched a dog-friendly workplace scheme trying to um, equip corporate companies with the ability to have dogs safely and happily in offices with their workers, because we know not all dogs are happy to be in an office. My own dog is definitely not happy to be in the office with me. Um, so but assessing dogs that are able to do that and then making workplaces friendly for that to potentially either avoid dogs being left for long lengths of time or dogs being um, given up in the short term. I think it's a bit of a miserable message and I was at the Association of Dogs and Cats Home in the UK conference a couple of weeks ago and it felt like it resonated with all of the charities there which is <laughs> kind of uh, everybody in agreement of how gloomy things are right now that we probably haven't reached peak relinquishment or peak behavioural euthanasia levels right now and the cost of living crisis could be that tipping point for some owners. So there's a real need for the sector to find innovative and low cost ways to support owners and keep dogs in those homes where that's the right thing for them, ideally. And lastly, I think some of the persistent changes we've seen to puppy buying really necessitate greater public education and behaviour change initiatives to try and avoid, avoid some of those changes becoming embedded in puppy buying culture, whether that's the UK or Canada. We don't want to see more stories of puppies dying on aeroplanes to come to Canada. I don't want to see stories of boots full of puppies coming in either ill or near death um, to the ports of Dover in the UK to try and fill this demand. And again, this disconnect between the cute puppy that you buy and where it came from, I think really needs strengthening. And I think learning more about how we can link those two things together, perhaps, for example, from the production animal sector, when we think about welfare labelling of animal products, we almost need that for our puppies too. So to finish up, a huge thank you for everybody for listening. I have to say thanks to all of the amazing team. We're a right ragtag bunch who've been working on this, bringing lots of different expertise, but a really good fun team to work with. Um, particularly all the different funding sources. This has very much been a project of here's the pot, we're to chuck some money in and keep it going, then we'd be really grateful. So we've had really good support from multiple UK charities who very generously funded this to date. We've had three papers come out so far, um, all open access if you're interested, two which I've just got described today, another one around changes to demographics, particularly what, how and why people buy designer crossbreeds. Spoiler, they all think they're hypoallergenic. Um, and just to finish up, a heads up from um, Georgia that the next webinar, seminar, I'm guessing he's in person? No, webinar. Webinar, sorry. Will be the wonderful Hanno Verbal from Fern University. Any questions? And if the question is, why is this a kitten? It's because I have deep internal conflict trying to find a picture of a dog of a breed that I'm happy with where the dog also doesn't look terrified. So <laughs> this is why we've gone for the cute kitten. <laughs>